All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. How's everyone morning? Feel free to unmute and just quickly kind of give a shout out on how you're doing. I'm doing great. It's Asha from Lifelong Medical Care. Hi, Asha. Hi. Good morning. It's Marlon A. Riley from Housing Consortium of the East Bay. I'm great. How are you? Good. Um, okay, so we have a couple people who are doing well, hopefully more than that. Um, but we're going to go ahead and dive in because we do have a lot to cover in an hour and a half this morning. Um, so you are all here for a housing services overview um, with Housing Solutions for Health. I'm Colleen Budenholzer. I work with Alameda County Healthcare Services Agency and I am the Home Stretch Program Manager. Um, so thank you all for being here. We have a great mix of folks today. So I was looking at the list of people who were registered prior to this, and we have people from FQHCs and healthcare settings. We have people who are part of Project Room Key. Um, we have folks who are uh, kind of on the more of the property management services side. So we have a really diverse group of people today. So I'm really excited for the questions, and we're going to have a breakout group where all of you can chat a little bit later um, with all different uh, people from all different organizations. So we're really excited about that. And we don't have a lot of time for introductions today just because we have such a big group. So instead of doing individual intros, we're gonna do a quick poll just to kind of see where people are at and how they're feeling um, currently in terms of their knowledge of housing services. So we're gonna pull up this poll. What's your knowledge of housing services? A, I know there's a crisis, but don't know the services. B, I know a few things here and there. C, I know enough, but want to get more comfortable. Or D, I'm going to co-facilitate the next training. I'll be writing all your names down who respond to D. No, I'm just kidding. I don't get to see who says what. But go ahead and, and share, your, share the poll now. We'll just give like 25 seconds to answer because it's pretty quick. Okay, thank you for doing the poll there. So we have 45%, I know a few things here and there, 39%, I know enough but want to get more comfortable. No one's volunteered to co-facilitate with me next time, but maybe at the end of the training, someone will feel more comfortable to do that. Um, and a few who know there's a crisis but don't know the services. So we kind of have, uh, have a little bit of a mix, so that's great. I do want to just set the tone that today really is an overview. So there's certain topics that um, we would love to delve into more and that there will hopefully be future trainings to allow for that. But today we're going to kind of skim the surface a little bit on things and kind of dip our toes in the water and then we can hopefully deep dive at a later date. All right. Thank you for that poll. And we're going to move. Oh, okay. So there's a few things that we're going to cover today. One, we're going to sort of cover the landscape of housing in Alameda County, and I'm going to get real with you all um, because we are in a housing crisis, and it's important for us to know what the landscape is, what the housing stock looks like, so that we can be really realistic and truthful and honest with the folks that we're serving about what the landscape is. Um, we're also going to talk about coordinated entry and the coordinated entry system, how to access it, what it does, and also a little bit about what it doesn't do. And then we're also going to do a home stretch overview and talk a little bit about document readiness. All three of these things could be their own training. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on each and then um, hopefully there can be some follow ups to dip to dive in deeper. So in Alameda County, we are in a housing crisis. Nearly 53% of Alameda County residents spend more than 30% of, of their income on housing. So um, the national standard for kind of not being rent burdened is 30% of income on housing. So more than half of residents in Alameda County are rent burdened. And 25%, so an entire quarter of Alameda County residents have at least one of four severe housing problems, which is either overcrowding, not having uh, access to a kitchen, lack of plumbing facilities, or high housing costs that are more than 50% of income on housing. So we certainly have a housing crisis that impacts both the rates of homelessness and also people's uh, like having safe and stable housing who maybe aren't necessarily experiencing homelessness. 
Um, this data is from the 2019 point in time count, which everyone home uh, is, you know, has a full report on their website about the 2019 point in time count. So if you're interested in diving in deeper, I encourage you to look at that report. Um, but these are sort of some basic statistics from that. So on any given night, we uh, expect that there's around 8,022 people who are experiencing homelessness in Alameda County. And that was a 43% increase since 2017. So the housing crisis really isn't getting better, it's getting worse. Um, and I know that, you know, I personally am very concerned about the impacts of the pandemic and how that's gonna um, have long-term impacts on people's housing stability and on increased rates of homelessness. So, you know, we are, we are in a tough situation here in Alameda County. 21% uh, of the folks who are homeless on any given night are typically in shelter and around 79% are unsheltered. Okay, so we're going to, on the next slide, go over the HUD definition of literally homeless, but I wanna kind of gauge where people are at because this is a definition that is often used in our system of care and in our community. Um, there are a lot of programs that require that someone meets the HUD definition of literally homeless in order to access those programs. Um, coordinated entry, actually, in order for someone to get a coordinated entry assessment and get um, access to the coordinated entry system, they have to be literally homeless at the time of their assessment. So this is sort of a definition that's used throughout our continuum of care. So we're going to delve into it, but I'd love to see if anyone um, could sort of take on this quiz. So. The question is, what's not included in the definition of HUD literally homeless? An emergency shelter or a hotel or motel paid for by a charitable organization or government programs, couch surfing, transitional housing designated for homeless persons, or fleeing domestic violence situations. So what's not included? Which one of these situations? Let's give it 10 more seconds. Okay. All right, so 51% said couch surfing, and that is correct. So that is part of the HRSA definition of literally homeless, but is not part of the HUD definition. For the 36% that said transitional housing, what you might be thinking of is that someone in transitional housing cannot be considered chronically homeless, just to make it really, really confusing. Um, so we can talk more about that, but the next slide is gonna go over the definition in full and we can um, bring that up now, if my computer will let me. Okay. So the HUD definition of literally homeless, so at the time of requests for assistance, the current living situation has to be one of the following in order for someone to meet the definition of literally homeless. They need to be staying in a place not meant for human habitation, in an emergency shelter or a hotel or motel paid for by a charitable organization or government, transitional housing designated for homeless persons. And this one is interesting because there are some like independent living homes or other places that people kind of market as transitional housing. But in order for it to be considered transitional housing for the purposes of the HUD definition, it has to be specifically for people who are literally homeless upon entry and it has to be publicly funded as transitional housing. So we actually only have a handful of transitional housing programs in our community. Um, if someone's fleeing a domestic violence situation with nowhere to go, they do meet the definition of literally homeless. Um, or if someone's in an institutional setting for less than 90 days and they were homeless upon entry and don't have an alternative exit destination, then they are literally homeless. And institutional settings include things like um, skilled nursing facilities, they include um, jails, prisons, they include hospital settings, they include substance use treatment. So those are sort of uh, what we mean by institutional housing settings. And again, this is different than the HRSA definition. So um, there are kind of programs that are mostly sort of outside of our system, including like the McKinney-Vento Act has a different definition of homelessness than, than the HUD definition. Okay, so we, um, 
let's see. Okay, so we spent some time talking about the landscape a little bit, and then now we're going to talk a little bit about what permanent housing options there are in our community and beyond. So basically thinking through what the different options are if you're an individual looking for housing or you're serving someone who's looking for housing. So one and the biggest one that, you know, most people will find housing through and that many of us have found housing through is the private market. So this is going to be your kind of typical housing search on Craigslist, apartments.com, calling the apartments that you find on Yelp, um, those kinds of just sort of private market, um, either corporate or independent um, homeowners having housing that you can rent or own also. So private market also includes home ownership. Another thing is uh, community or independent living facilities. So this is going to be sort of like shared living arrangements. So things like rooms and boards, things like independent living homes. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, we have an organization in Alameda County called the Independent Living um, Association. And they are able to provide technical assistance to independent living homes. And they also kind of do uh, inspections and look through people's documents, et cetera, um, in order for someone to become part of the independent living association community. And so those are homes that you can really trust are going to be, you know, following fair housing and have like safe and good living conditions. And there's a website that you can go to, um, which we can certainly send out with the follow up. Um, that can help you to look for independent living homes that um, meet certain standards. And then this also would include like sober living environments, SROs, dorms, etc. So community or independent living facilities. Then there's affordable housing buildings. So these are buildings in which the units are subsidized through some sort of fashion. So some of it is public housing, some of it is nonprofit housing, some of it could be for-profit housing with tax credits. So um, a building or a unit in which there's an income limit. So it's specifically designed for people who have a low income or a very low income or um, so they're at different levels of income. So some are like for very low, some are for low, some are for moderate or below. Um, and that the unit is subsidized. So you wouldn't be paying uh, what's considered market rate for that unit. And then there's affordable housing subsidies and these are different than buildings because they're tenant based. So it's an individual who is applying for and receiving a subsidy and then there's a housing search component in order to find a place that will allow the person to use that subsidy and that also is a place that they want to live and a place that meets their housing needs. Uh, and some examples of these are Section 8, so that's kind of a very well-known one. There's HUD bash, so there's subsidies particularly for veterans. So if you're working with a veteran, that would be a great thing to explore. Um, Shelter Plus Care, MHSA, THP Plus for transitional age youth folks. Um, and then there's kind of one other bucket of housing, which is licensed care facilities. And this would include like licensed board and cares and assisted living. And feel free to drop questions in the chat throughout if you have questions. And David and Yadiel are going to um, kind of oversee that and let me know if I should pause for answering some questions. Okay, so I said I was going to get real with you all. So now is one of the times to do that. So this is a housing need allocation report card, and it was created by the Southern California News Group. Um, there's a full link, there's a link to the full news story on this, but basically housing and community development, the state, state housing and community development um, creates regional housing need allocations. And what that is, is basically how many units of a particular type of housing we would need in our community in order for us to have like a right sized housing market. So in order for there to be housing units for everyone who needs them in the income category that they need it. So I sort of only took the two ends. So there's things in between like um, low income and moderate income. But if we look at the two sides of it, so first of all, we can see on the far right when we look at the overall grades that the different jurisdictions in Alameda County, we all have C's and D's. So we're not doing very well in terms of having enough housing allocated 
in the right categories for people who need it. So um, we definitely need more housing and we need more housing of particular types. And so then you can also see that for the, the grades um, for very low income and for area or for above moderate income, so this column, I don't think you can see my pointer, but for this column that says VLI grade, this is the very low income grade. So this is saying what's our grade in terms of how many very low income units we would need in order to meet the demand in Alameda County. And our jurisdictions are not doing well here. We are C's and F's. So we're definitely seeing a disparate impact of how, like having enough housing for people who are very low income. And then for above moderate income, we have anywhere from A's to D's, but certainly there's a much better fit of the number of above moderate income units and the people who have an above moderate income than there is for very low income. So this is just sort of an illustration of the reality of our housing crisis um, so that we can have honest conversations with folks we serve about what it looks like right now. All right. So now I kind of brought the whole mood down, um, talking about the housing crisis, which I think most of us are aware of, but just sort of being real about that. But now what can we do? So given the current circumstances, given the situation that we're in, what can we do? So the first thing is to keep a safe place if you have one. So prevention is key. If there's someone who's in a living situation that's unstable, the first thing to do is think about what we can do to make that living situation stable. This is of course assuming that there's not like any safety issues uh, with that current situation. Um, so that, that's a big deal. So thinking about, you know, are, are there any fair housing violations that need to be explored? Um, is there one-time assistance, like one-time housing related financial assistance that could help someone maintain their housing? Um, could there be mod a, a mediation with the person that they're living with, et cetera? So keeping a place if someone has one is, is really key because um, we'd want to avoid someone experiencing an episode of homelessness if that's not necessary. Another thing is living with others. So um, social connectedness can be a buffer against high housing costs. So this could be, you know, living with a roommate so that you can afford a two bedroom apartment with someone else. This could be living with family or friends. This could be renting a room from someone you know. So um, really like increasing community ties and also exploring the community ties and the natural supports that folks have. Uh, community living facilities is an interim step. So I think one of the big things is that as we help folks to sort of manage their housing journey, a lot of times there's steps in the process. So I think it's really cool to like learn about and explore what someone's housing vision is. Like what would they be their ideal housing situation? And then sometimes that, that can be something that could be realized right away or sometimes there could be steps in the in the middle so for example it might make sense for some people to go to a sober living environment while they're looking for their own apartment or maybe it would make sense for someone to go to an independent living home or a shared housing situation while they're working toward you know increasing their income so that they can afford a larger unit independently um, the other thing is managing the journey of applying to affordable housing and private market housing. So the way most affordable housing program or uh, buildings work is that they open a wait list. People sign up for that wait list and then a small number of the folks who are on that wait list are called. So it can feel discouraging. However, if someone signs up for 20 wait lists, and they have a 5% chance of getting called for each of those wait lists, then they have a 64% chance overall of getting contacted for an affordable housing. This is also one of those things really thinking about like interim steps. A lot of times getting affordable housing does take time because of the wait list aspect to it. So maybe that could be something that um, is being worked on while someone's potentially in like a shared housing situation or something else. We can help consumers address housing barriers and build on housing assets. So um, if someone has poor credit, there's oftentimes things that can be done to address that. Uh, increasing income, of course, um, you know, increasing social connectedness, and really also recognizing the assets that people have. So a lot of people do have 
things that are going to help them to find housing, including like people they know, including having good renters history, all of those different things. And then also just not to rely on emergency and transitional housing to sort of be, to work on its own to get someone transitioned into a more permanent housing situation and to work alongside. So if you're a service provider that's been working with someone for a while and they go into an emergency or transitional housing setting to continue to work with them on their housing plan and also engage with the staff there. So basically to increase the size of the service team in order to move that person toward a safer and more permanent housing situation. Um, I think this is like really relevant right now because we of course have increased the number of of, um, emergency housing units in our community because of the pandemic response and the project room key programs. So if you're working with someone who goes into one of those programs, continuing to provide support and helping them with their housing plan, but also linking in with the staff that's on site is really essential to people's housing success. Okay, I wanted to just bring up because we talked a lot um, kind of with the first bullet about keeping housing. So this is one resource that can be really, really helpful for that is the Bay Area Legal AIDS Tenants Rights Line. So this um, is a free hotline that people can call if they're experiencing housing related issues. So if you're working with someone who potentially may be experiencing a housing issue, you that there could be a legal component to it. So maybe they're getting like a wrongful eviction or um, their landlord is, you know, asking them to do something that's not, that doesn't make sense uh, legally or someone's applying for housing and they're being discriminated against, then this is a great uh, resource for folks. I mean, one quick question for you. Um, can you provide a list of low income or affordable housing in the county? That's a good question. Um, so at this very moment, there's not a great place for all of it to be together. There are some websites that I can share. Um, and so we can send those out at the end along with some of the other information. But I will say that there is a project being worked on in the county to create a portal for applying for affordable housing. This is something that's been done in San Francisco County. So it would basically be like a one stop place where someone could see what affordable housing units are and they could apply. And then they also could save their basic application information in it. So they wouldn't have to re enter all the time. So, you know, a lot of times um, certain properties have like more specific questions that they want to ask. So there might be like a secondary application. But the idea is that it would be a little bit like if you think about like LinkedIn or Indeed, where you can like hit like the apply button and it has like your resume already uploaded, that kind of idea, but for affordable housing. So that's coming down the pipeline, but it doesn't exist yet. But I'm really excited for that because I think it'll be helpful. And one other thing that you just dragged my memory about um, when we're thinking about affordable housing uh, applications is that the probability of getting a call back for seniors is quite a bit higher. So there's a, a bigger stock of affordable housing for seniors. So if you are working with seniors, that's a really good pathway to work on while they're in potentially an interim situation. Um, yeah. Any other questions right now? I am going to pause for a second because we're going to kind of transition into another topic and just see if anyone briefly has questions. Feel free to unmute yourselves or um, write something in the chat box. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we'll move on, but if you think of anything, again, feel free to write it in the chat box or we'll pause for questions again later. So please write it down so that we can cover it. Um, so that was a little bit about the housing landscape. So I think one of the takeaways is housing is difficult in our community for sure. And people need support um, in order to, you know, navigate our very difficult housing system sometimes. Um, coordinated entry is one aspect of sort of working with someone who is looking for housing, but it's not the only thing. So you all as providers um, have a lot of skills and have the ability to help move folks toward housing, uh, both inside and outside the coordinated entry system. So I am going to talk about the coordinated entry system, but this is not the only thing that will help someone on their housing journey. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I do want to do an introduction. So 
coordinated entry is a standard process and a shared set of tools for access, housing problem solving, assessment, prioritization, and matching to housing and homeless resources, as well as grievances. So the idea is that there's basically multiple access points. So there's kind of no wrong door and then people are having equitable access to resources based on sort of a, 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 um, an agreed upon assessment that the there was a lot of work and a lot of stakeholders that were involved with. So in the past, sometimes there would be an opening at a shelter or permits part of housing, et cetera. And some of it would be about like who you know or um, what client had an advocate or a service provider at that time. So coordinated entry, the idea is that there's more equitable access to resources based on need and that the most in need are being served um, with some of the different programs. So here are some of the access points to coordinated entry. So, you know, some of the folks on this call actually probably can do coordinated entry assessments. So there are other access points, for example, through shelters, or if you're, um, you know, working with an agency that has access to do coordinated entry assessments. However, for anyone that doesn't have like direct access or access within their agency, or for anyone in the community at all, there's two ways that someone can easily access coordinated entry. So one one is to call 211. So that's always a great place to start because even if you call 211, they can connect you to a housing resource center. And then the other is to, um, to go directly to a housing resource center. And pre-COVID, the housing resource centers all had drop-in hours. Um, and now they still have drop-in hours, but they're over the phone. So people can call during the drop-in hours and do assessments over the phone. Um, and it is good to let people know that they usually will get a voicemail box and get a call back so that there's like one line people coming in and then, you know, multiple people can call back potentially. So just kind of to set that up for folks, but they can directly call the housing resource centers in addition to 211. And then these are some of the services that are pe that people are matched to. So one of the things I was sort of mentioning at the beginning is there are services that are matched through coordinated entry for people experiencing homelessness, but there are also some services that are not matched through coordinated entry. So some of the services that are matched are housing navigation, um, year-round publicly funded shelters. So, so on the other side, services that are not matched are like inclement weather shelters, DV shelters, navigation centers, privately funded shelters. So there are some shelters that are outside the coordinated entry system. Transitional housing is matched through coordinated entry. Rapid rehousing is matched through coordinated entry. Permanent supportive housing is matched through coordinated entry and tenancy sustaining services. And tenancy sustaining services is a uh, kind of um, the jargon for continued case management in order to provide housing stability when someone transitions into permanent supportive housing. And oftentimes the person who helps the individual to manage their housing journey also can provide tenancy sustaining services. And then there's also programs that specifically provide tenancy sustaining services. So if someone's transitioning into permanent supportive housing, tenancy sustaining services is kind of a component of the services that are available to that individual. Okay, so again, getting real. So assessment and beyond. So um, it's important to note that when someone gets a coordinated entry assessment, that's not sort of, okay, that's done. Now that system is gonna take care of their housing journey. Cause that's not the reality because of, again, the resources that we have and the need and how high the need is. So when I pulled these numbers last week, there were 10,865 people on the countywide binding list. So when someone gets a coordinated entry assessment, what happens is that they go onto the countywide by name list and it's ordered based on assessment scores. And the scores are, um, the scores are based on the assessment answers and are meant to be a proxy for the need, how high needs the household is, how vulnerable, and there's various things that go into that scoring. So there's things like disabilities and health status, and there's things like the time that someone's experienced homelessness. So the longer someone's experienced homelessness, that's going to give them a little bit of a higher score. Um, things like age, things like household size. So there's, there's a variety of factors that go into the coordinated entry assessment score. 
And of that 10,865, around 500 people are likely to get matched to some sort of housing resource in the next few months. So as you can see, that's not, you know, that's, that's not meeting the need. There's a lot more people that resources than are going to be matched to them. So that's one of the reasons that it's really important to continue supporting folks on their housing journey even after they've entered the coordinated entry system. And the percentage of people who are going to get an offer of permanent supportive housing over the course of a year is 5 to 10 percent. Um, so we'll talk more about the permanent supportive housing target list and the permanent supportive housing process, but um, the binding list is definitely not a waiting list for permanent supportive housing. Most people who have an assessment and most people who are on the by name list are never going to get an offer of permanent supportive housing, um, but some will, and that is the only way to access that. So uh, it's important to just kind of be real with people about their likelihood of getting matched to services or matched to a housing resource. Uh, and then the good side of it is that some people can and will resolve their homelessness without a long-term subsidy, without a housing navigator, and without any of the resources that are matched through coordinated entry. Colleen, before we move on, um, we have a couple of questions uh, regarding the last slide. Um, can you explain further what rapid rehousing is? Yes, so rapid rehousing is going to be a short-term subsidy, typically up to 24 months, and it's usually titrated. So what that means is that the subsidy will pay a larger percent of the rent and then over time pay a smaller percent of the rent and the, um, the tenant will pay a larger percent. So the idea with rapid rehousing is that it's giving time to transition for the household to be able to take over the rent in that unit. Um, so this is an intervention that's often used with people who are, um, you know, in job search, but definitely have, you know, potential options for, for a job that could, you know, allow them to pay their rent. It can also be used sometimes as a bridge to a subsidy uh, housing opportunity. So rapid rehousing is a short-term subsidy. Yeah. Another question we have is, um, how, can you explain how to apply for tenancy sustaining services, especially when many programs are unable to, pro to provide long-term case management? Yeah, so um, t funded tenancy sustaining services are only available to people who are moving into permanent supportive housing. And typically, when we make a referral to permanent supportive housing through Homestretch, we look and see if that individual has a service provider that can provide ongoing services. So sometimes that's tenancy sustaining services, but sometimes that's also like an FSP, a full service partnership behavioral health care program. But if someone doesn't have an ongoing service provider, let's say that one of the fabulous navigators at a shelter helped them manage the PSH process, then we will make that referral. Um, and if there are people who like transitioned in and maybe didn't want services at the time or something else, then there is a form that can be used, a referral form to request tenancy sustaining services. Um, but they do have to be in a in a unit or using a subsidy that's considered permanent supportive housing and that's matched through home stretch in order to be eligible for that. And then we have one last question for now. Um, in terms of eligibility and availability of these services, um, uh, what about folks who are undocumented? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so some of the navigation services, a large amount of the navigation services are currently funded by the whole person care waiver, which means that people have to have Medi-Cal to qualify. So there is a smaller universe of services. The same kind of goes for permanent supportive housing. There are permanent supportive housing options for people who are undocumented. So I think sometimes people just assume that if someone's undocumented, that's not an option, which is not true. So there are options for people who are undocumented, but it's just a smaller universe of options. So for example, we have healthcare services agency funded subsidies through MHSA and people who are undocumented have access to those subsidies 
complexities um, if, if prioritized and eligible just like anyone else. Um, but some of the subsidies that are funded in different ways don't necessarily allow for that. So there's just a smaller universe and we try to match people appropriately based on that. But it definitely is tough. And I think this is honestly an area that I've heard coming up a lot in some of the different project room key meetings that I've been in and others. And um, something that I think is being explored more to try to create more training around how to support that community because it definitely is harder to find housing. And another one in terms of specific populations, uh, what about clients who are immunocompromised? Um, are we talking people who would meet HAPWA eligibility, so people who are living with HIV or AIDS? Did you say? I, they didn't say, but you that say could be. You say yeah, so if that is the case, there are specific units that are HAPWA funded. Um, and so that means that they are for people who are living with HIV or AIDS, and that's one of the eligibility criteria. That's one of the questions that's asked on the coordinated entry assessment. So when home stretch is matching to those units, we filter for people who have um, reported that they're living with HIV or AIDS, and then we we match folks based on that. Um, there is some discussion happening also in the community about how to kind of make that process better because that's something that oftentimes maybe isn't disclosed at a first assessment for very you know reasonable reasons. Um, so. Sorry. Um, so there's some discussion. There's some discussion happening around that, but it is um, it's something that that we do match to units with that specific funding in our community. And sometimes there are also HAPWA units that are not permanent supportive housing that are managed the same way that affordable housing units are managed. It's kind of like waitlist openings, and then people apply to the waitlist. So there's there's both. That's it for now. In terms of questions. Sorry about that. Getting used to Zoom. This is my first Zoom training, so thank you all for your patience. I'm learning the whole technology thing. <laughs> all right, so given the circumstances, um, kind of what we talked about before, given the scarcity, what are some things that you can do as a service provider? So one is you can do housing problem solving, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. There is also um, housing problem solving training that's gonna be rolled out countywide that's like a two-part training, eight hours, much more in depth than we can do today, but we'll kind of touch the surface of that. Uh, you can connect individuals to the coordinated entry system. We talked about how to do that. Keep working on housing solutions together. So continue to address housing as part of the whole person. You know, we know that someone who's unhoused is at risk of, um, you know, health conditions. We know that housing is health, basically. In order for someone to really be able to take care of their health and well-being, they need to have their basic needs met, of one of which is housing. Uh, and we can also help individuals get document ready, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means. So those are kind of four concrete things that as service providers, working in a clinic, whether you're working in a shelter, whether you're street outreach, whether you're a health homes provider, no matter what the role, these are some things that you can do in order to help folks who are currently experiencing homelessness. And a lot of these also are helpful for people who are at risk, particularly problem solving. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about housing problem solving. Again, everyone can do it regardless of where you're kind of seated and where you work or what your role is. Um, so the, the crux of housing problem solving is really having deep conversations to explore housing possibilities. Um, so it's exploring someone's current crisis. Some of that exploration is also learning like what led here. Also, when have people had successes in the past and how can the like skills and resources and assets that uh, culminated in those successes be leveraged for future housing opportunities or for current housing opportunities. Deep listening is really important. So housing problem solving is a lot about evoking um, from the client what their housing goals are and also what housing pathways they see for themselves and what's worked for them in the past. So really listening to understand and trying to understand where someone's at right now and what their experiences have been. Can use kind of motivational, motivational interviewing skills to identify priorities and strengths. So open-ended questions, reflections, summaries, affirmations, those are all really helpful skills during a housing problem-solving conversation. 
um, concrete housing problem solving support and motivation. So some of this is also where our role as people who understand the system and who understand the resources comes in, which is the concrete problem solving. So letting people know what they may or may not have access to so that they can create a realistic housing plan. Um, and then thinking creatively about housing options and honoring all ideas. So it's kind of like when you brainstorm and you there's like no judgment, it's like any idea is a good idea, get as crazy as you want. That's a little bit how I like to think of problem solving because sometimes something will come up that people maybe hadn't thought of. So maybe there's like an individual in their life that they you know, would like to reach out to to see if that could potentially, they potentially would want to you know, be a roommate or they potentially could rent a room or they could stay with them for a little while even while they kind of figure out their next step. Um, and then being real about the housing crisis. So letting people know, you know, the realities of shelter living, letting people know what the availability is, what their likelihood is of getting permanent supportive housing or some other sort of subsidized housing, what the likelihood is of is getting affordable housing or what the time frame is. So some of it might be, hey, we can apply for all these different affordable housing properties and we will do that. Let's talk about what we could do in the meantime to get you into a safer housing situation while we're waiting for affordable housing. So now I wanna do a little bit of engagement and discussion. So if you can please unmute and share what are some of the outcomes that result from housing problem solving. Feel free to also share some stories if you've done housing problem solving with someone, obviously de-identified, but of how that's worked and what the outcome has been. So if you can unmute or share in the chat, I'd love for people to unmute to hear some other people's voices. Uh, maybe family reunification. Yes, family reunification for sure. Hello. Um, I've had people um, use their, their congregation and their church, um, and people have found housing through that reason. Absolutely. Natural supports for sure. And community supports. I'm looking at the participant list. I know there's people in here who do housing problem solving. I'm going to give it another minute. Hopefully people also feel free to share in the chat if you're not as comfortable unmuting. Um, this is David. Health improvement, um, a sense of safety, security, uh, uh, just a general sense of uh, pride restored and dignity. Thank you. This goes along with family reunification often, but maybe moving to a different state um, with a more affordable housing market. Yeah, absolutely. Even different places in our state that are a little bit more affordable. Folks have also mentioned improved mental health and security and privacy as well. Absolutely. All right, well, thank you for sharing. I'm going to um, talk about a couple of different potential outcomes, if I can. Okay, so a lot of these were mentioned. So reunification with family or friends, um, addressing specific barriers to sustainable housing. So if there's unpaid bills, previous evictions, a lot of you mentioned mental health, um, like decreasing symptoms or people feeling more confident, comfortable, employment opportunities and additional sources of income such as social security. So if people are disabled and unable to work and not yet on social security disability or SSI, then it would be really important to help them manage that journey so that um, income can potentially increase. There's also opportunities to connect people with employment resources. Um, and then shared housing. So this could be shared housing that's already established. This could be bringing in a roommate. 
um, and other things that you all mentioned. So an example is moving to a more affordable housing, uh, like a place with a more affordable housing market. Okay. So those are some of the results from housing problem solving. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, steps to reduce barriers. So one is get people connected to public benefits, general assistance, SSI, CalFresh, or what was traditionally called food stamps employment training, job training um, to help with income, also continued education, um, which isn't listed here as a potential like long-term plan for increasing income, uh, connecting people to mental health and health resources, so Medi-Cal and access to primary care, mental health services, so people have mild to moderate uh, mental health symptoms or a mild to moderate mental health diagnosis, then they can receive mental health care through a federally qualified health center, which is oftentimes also where some of our folks get primary care, where some of us get primary care. Um, and then moderate to severe mental illness or symptoms would be served through access, um, which is a phone line that can be called to connect people to mental health care. And then there's substance use disorder treatment, in-home support services for people who need a little bit more support to live independently. So those are all things that can help to address barriers to housing. Okay, and then types of um, resources that, sorry, there's something on my screen, types of resources that can help folks. So one is affordable and specialized housing search. So helping people to, you know, find affordable housing opportunities, apply for them, et cetera. Um, resources to live with others, re-entry housing resources. So if there are folks who are formerly incarcerated, there's programs specifically that serve that population. Uh, temporary housing resources like shelter, domestic violence resources, uh, housing related time limited financial assistance. So this actually can help a lot of people. So there are folks who are experiencing homelessness or who are at risk of homelessness who really have the income in order to sustain housing, but they don't necessarily have the ability to save for those initial move in costs. So housing related time limited financial assistance could be helping someone to pay back rent if they get behind on their rent, but it could also be helping someone who's experiencing homelessness to um, pay their first month's rent, pay their security deposit, home furnishings, household items, kind of those really expensive initial move-in costs if that person's capable of, or not capable, everyone's capable, but if that person has an income in order to sustain their housing. Um, and then legal assistance can be helpful, like Bay Area Legal Aid. Um, also, there's other, there's HACC that supports people who are applying for uh, public benefits and other great legal resources. And then housing, education, and counseling. So um, making sure that folks have all the information about, et cetera. Colin, can you repeat the last couple of sentences you, you went out? Oh, sorry. Um, housing education council. So, kind of some education about the housing resources that exist, also just about the housing market and how to navigate it, um, et cetera. Okay. So, um, in the spirit of time, I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but we're sending out, you know, the information. Information, but this is sort of a moniker that you can think of in your work, which is real basic. So this is actually, um, I guess this, there, I wasn't around for this story, but the story is that there was a social worker when we were talking about the work that we do in the housing crisis response system, who basically said, this is real basic social work. So that's where the moniker came from. Um, and real is basically how we do the work. So how we engage with the folks that we serve and how we engage with the community. And then basic is the what. So what are we actually helping people with? Um, what resources? Any questions at this time? Yeah, we had a question earlier. Um, for those who are ready document and housing ready, what are some of the resources available to secure them something more than temporary housing during this rental and housing crisis here in the Bay Area? Yeah, so that's a good question. So it depends a little bit on several factors. So if the person's on the permanent supportive housing target list, then that could be a potential resource for them. 
For other people, a lot of it um, is about basically seeing what's realistic for their income and potentially helping someone to increase their income if there's not a lot of realistic housing opportunities and having realistic conversations about that or, or conversations about um, how how their income could be used for safe and stable housing here if they want to stay here. So if it's not high enough to rent a market rate unit, then is there a consideration that they might want to live with a roommate? Might they want to be in shared housing? So I do want to say like there's not enough subsidized housing for everyone. So we can't operate on the idea that if someone has documents and is ready for housing, but they don't have enough income to afford their own apartment, that they're going to get a subsidy to afford it because that's not realistic because of how many people are in that situation. Um, so it's important to be realistic about that. So helping people to apply for subsidy programs that are open and available. So making sure they're in the coordinated entry system, making sure that if they have a disability and there's NED voucher, waitlist open, which is non-elderly disabled subsidies, that they're doing that. Veterans, I can't say this enough. If you're working with veterans, please, 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 please get them connected to veteran resources, SSVF, HUDVASH if they're eligible. That's, that's hugely underutilized, I think, um, with some of the folks in our community. The VA, there's a lot of resources for veterans that are not necessarily directly through our coordinated entry system, but who, that are through the VA. Um, but a lot of it is thinking about what's realistic and helping that person figure out their housing pathway based on their experience and their situation and what they want. Any other questions right now? Hopefully this means that it's clear and not, not that everyone's so confused they don't have questions. Um, all right. I do have so a question, gonna, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so I just got access to Clarity. So some folks I do see are on the target list. How often um, does that get refreshed? Like basically how often should I be checking with the folks that I'm working with if they are on the list or not? That's a great question, once a month. Um, so we, we pull the refresh list the first Monday of the month. So that will be this Monday, but then it takes us a while to get all of the, um, the, the alerts in. So, you know, the, the week after the first Monday of the month is when you'd want to check and see, um, if that person has, has a target list alert. And we're going to talk more about what the target list is in our next kind of section. Okay. Okay, so we're going to transition into doing a home stretch overview. So I'm going to talk a little bit about home stretch, the permanent part of housing process and document readiness. I just kind of want to set the stage that like we have a two hour training that covers this and we also have a two hour training that covers just chronic homeless verification. So we're going to dip our toes in and scratch the surface and direct you to some resources where you can get more information, um, but also this isn't going to cover everything during the time that we have allotted today, uh, but we're going to do our best. So the goal of Homestretch is to prioritize and streamline access to supportive services and permanent supportive housing for households experiencing homelessness in Alameda County with a head of household who has a disability. So um, that's kind of the role of Homestretch. I see Homestretch as the bridge between subsidy administrators and property managers who are providing permanent supportive housing and the service providers who are working with folks experiencing homelessness. Um, I also want to say that home stretch we're, we're kind of like matchmakers. We don't act, get, actually get to decide if there's a love connection. So we make referrals to permanent supportive housing. But at the end of the day, the housing provider, the housing agency, or the subsidy administrating agency has the final say on who gets approved for housing. Um, so we'll talk about that with the home stretch process. Uh, again, just kind of setting the stage. So thinking about permanent supportive housing in Alameda County, there's about 2,000 units of PSH in Alameda County in total, and those vary in different types. There's tenant-based or scattered site rental assistance, there's master lease subsidies, there's site-based uh, permanent supportive housing in which the actual unit is subsidized. Um, 1,200 to 1,300 of the subsidies or of the 2,000 total units are scattered sites, so primarily MHSA, City of Berkeley Shelter Plus Care, and County Shelter Plus Care. 
and on average Alameda County has only 150 permanent supportive housing vacancies a year. So when we think about the fact that there's almost 11,000 people on the by name list, it's a small percentage that are going to get an offer of permanent supportive housing. Uh, we, we do see that that's going to increase this year. I can tell you with certainty at this point now that we're halfway through the year that it it is going to increase and has increased, um, but it's still not enough to meet the need. And home stretch and coordinated entry were not the creation of new permanent supportive housing, um, but the coordination of existing resources. So we make referrals when there's turnover. So if someone, if there's a vacancy because of exit, and also if there's new units created, um, and we, I can't see my screen. Uh, we only make referrals for eligible households, but we don't approve people for housing. So this is kind of the match maker thing I was talking about. So here's an overview of the referral process. So the first step is coordinated entry assessment, prioritization, and eligibility. So the permanent supportive housing target list is a subset of the binding list. Um, and so in order for someone to have an opportunity to be matched to permanent supportive housing, they have to have a coordinated entry assessment. So if you are working with people who are literally homeless, particularly people who um, appear to be quite vulnerable, have high medical needs, um, and who, you know, have been homeless for long periods of time, those are people to really make sure get coordinated entry assessments so that they could potentially have the option of an offer for permanent supportive housing. And then the next step is document readiness. So we prioritize people, people for matches who are document ready, and we're going to talk more about that. So uh, we want people to be working on supporting the folks they work with to become document ready, uh, basically as soon as they start working with them. The next step is housing match. Um, a housing match means that based on the data that we have through coordinated entry and based on the prioritization of coordinated entry, it appears that this individual or this household is eligible for this permanent supportive housing opportunity. And there's certain documents that are needed at the time of the match, typically, like an application. We'll talk about those. But the idea is that this is basically an invitation to apply. There are multiple matches per opening. So um, it doesn't mean that that housing opportunity is that person's. A match is not a referral and it's not an approval, but it's an opportunity to apply for that housing resource. I will say that most people who submit completed documents by the due date are usually referred. So it's a, an invitation with a high probability of acceptance. Um, and then there's that housing referral. So that means that we've received back at Homestretch, we've received all of the match uh, documents from the notification, the application looks complete, and then we're sending the referral on to the subsidy administrator. And then at that point, the, the uh, process kind of hands off and the subsidy administrator or the property manager does their review of the documents. There's oftentimes a compliance check, which includes like a background search and credit, um, hopefully not as often anymore but still certainly happening um, and we can help for at home stretch if you have questions or kind of to manage that process but really sort of we're kind of driving the car until referral and then the subsidy administrator is really kind of driving the car after that um, so we're now going to talk about the permanent part of housing target list which someone brought up earlier so the permanent support of housing target list is basically the people who score the most highly on the coordinated entry assessment and who are the top of the by name list. And it focuses attention on the highest need households on the by name list. So of course, this is the highest need based on coordinated entry assessment, which you know I know doesn't always necessarily feel like it lines up, but that, that's how um, home stretch is prioritizing folks. The head of household with, the coordinated, with a coordinated entry assessment score equal to or higher than the threshold score is placed on the permanent part of housing target list. And there's about five to 600 people on the target list. The reason that the threshold score is what it is and that the target list is the size that it is, is not based on the need, but based on the number of openings. So we understand that there's a lot of people who have you know, lower scores or who aren't on the target list who are in need of permanent supportive housing, but national best practice is to have a target list if you're gonna use kind of threshold scores or banding like they call it 
some communities, that's two times the number of uh, expected vacancies in a year. So that's why our list is 500 to 600 people, and that's why the threshold score was set where it was. And that'll be re-examined every 12 months based on data from the previous 12 months. Um, and households who are on this list are likely to receive a match to permanent part of housing if document ready. This also means that households not on this list are unlikely to receive a match to permanent part of housing. So the hope is that having the target list can help folks to have real conversations with the people that they're serving about their probability of getting permanent part of housing. If you want to know if someone you're working with is on the target list, if you have HMIS access, you can see there will be a banner at the top that says public alert. And if you click on it, there will be, um, if it's a permanent part of housing alert, it will say permanent part of housing target list. And those uh, alerts are also fed into the CHR, the community health record. So if you're someone who has access to the CHR but not to HMIS, you'll also be able to see the alert there. So you'll know if someone you're working with is on the target list within a period of time, because it does take us a minute to get those up. So if you assess someone, it, 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 it may take time. Okay, so that's the target list. I'm gonna move on to talk a little bit about permanent supportive housing eligibility. So this is a very basic eligibility. So um, this doesn't necessarily mean that people who meet this criteria are going to be matched or prioritized for permanent of housing, but people have to meet this criteria in order to be eligible for permanent supportive housing. So the head of household needs to be over 18, at a minimum literally homeless, so we talked about that definition earlier. A lot of subsidies require that the person's chronically homeless, but some do require only literal homelessness. Um, the person must be disabled, the head of household must be disabled, it cannot be a child, it has to be the head of household. Uh, they need to be an Alameda County resident and assessed through coordinated entry. And then each PSH opening often has its own eligibility criteria. So someone earlier, I think, asked about people who are living with HIV and AIDS or people who are immunocompromised. So there are, for example, specific um, subsidies for that group of folks. And so we will match based on that eligibility criteria. Uh, there's also oftentimes eligibility criteria for folks who have mental uh, mental health dis, uh, diagnosis or for people who um, are chronically homeless specifically. But when we send a match notification, that match notification will tell you what the requirements are and will tell you what documents are needed to support that eligibility determination. Okay, so document readiness. Those of you who know me know this is like my soapbox. So, um, <laughs> So document readiness is really important for everyone, regardless of whether there's a PSH option, or at least part of document readiness is important. So having documentation of identity, of income, of household makeup, credit, legal, housing history, these are gonna be things that for many different housing pathways, including private market housing, including affordable housing buildings, including subsidies, both PSH and not, are going to be Required. So helping folks to ensure that they have the documents that they need is really a first step in order for that person to move forward with housing opportunities. So it's really important to start working on that kind of from the beginning. Um, specifically for permanent supportive housing, there's two additional core documents besides identifying documents that are required, it's, which is documentation of homelessness and documentation of disability. Um, and heads of household must submit the four core documents before being eligible for a referral to permanent supportive housing. So we're prioritizing people who are document ready for permanent supportive housing matches. So currently households on the PSH target list with core documents completed and uploaded into HMIS are going to be prioritized for housing uh, opportunities through Homestretch. Okay, so these are the four core documents of a government issued photo ID, a social security card or social security number verification from social services agency, which I'm gonna share on the next slide. This is a new thing that we have that we're really excited about. Disability verification dated within the past 12 months and verification of literal homelessness dated within the last 14 days. Now for someone to be considered document ready as far as the HMIS documents uploaded, as long as someone has a verification of literal homelessness within the last year, they'll still be um, meeting the document ready kind of uh, 
stamp for prioritization, um, but then we'll ask for updated verification of homelessness at the time of the match. And then there's often additional documents required at the time of the match, like a housing application, verification of chronic homelessness, uh, disability specific verification. So if it's an opening for only people who have serious mental illness, then the disability verification has to reflect that. Um, identifying documents for other household members. So certainly households with minor children, making sure that there's birth certificates uh, that someone has access to is really important and that other adult household members have photo IDs and social security cards or social security number verification and also income verification. So this is a screenshot of our release of information with social services agencies. So many of you have probably seen this and use this to help get um, things like income verification for general assistance or copies of photo IDs if they have them on file. But the exciting thing about this is that um, we've expanded our partnership and there's a new checkbox on here that says letter verifying social security number income and benefits enrollment. And if that checkbox is checked and the person is in the social services system and they're able to verify their social security number, then they will produce a letter that basically verifies the social security number and states any income information they have access to. They ha always have access to income information on CalWORKs and general assistance. They only sometimes have access to income information for people on social people on social security benefits, but they do sometimes have access to that. And if they do, they'll, they'll include it in the letter. So this can be used in lieu of a social security card for most permanent supportive housing opportunities. Not 100%, but our largest kind of stock of permanent supportive housing, the providers and the subsidy administrators who are in that group have all agreed to accept this letter as the verification of social security number. So we're really hoping that social security cards are no longer a barrier. So you can fill out this form, which was sent out with your um, needing materials and send it to homestretch at acgov.org. If you need verification of social security number for someone, they'll also send us other documents that they have on file, but they have to have them on file. So for example, like a government issued photo ID, in order for us to get that back, that means that at some point, this, the individual that you're requesting it for applied for public benefits and gave them a copy of their ID. So they will provide us with whatever they're able to provide. And then we'll send, once it gets to home stretch, we'll send it back to you. So it is important, um, turning this in, in and of itself, does not make the person document ready. It's almost as if you're applying for a social security card and then you get it back and upload it and then the person's document ready. So this is requesting the document, but this form in and of itself doesn't um, make a person document ready. Colleen, before we move on, um, there's a couple of points of uh, uh, clarification. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the assessment, um, is it only done on the phone or are there forms that folks can fill out with their clients or their patients? The coordinated entry assessments have to be done by someone who has gone through the training to do them. And so it either needs to be done on the phone, in person, or if someone is a trained assessor, they can do it on paper and then enter it later. But um, my understanding and maybe this has changed, so I can double check on that. But my understanding is that typically it's either done over the phone or in person with an assessor. Okay. And what are the chances of getting the opportunity after being referred was another question. Yeah, so it depends a lot on the opportunity. I would say for the most part, very good, very high. Um, so when we have a single opening, so we have like one opening at you know a site where there's permanent sort of housing. We might make two referrals to that opening, and we'll tell the the person who's number two in the processing order when we make the referral. We'll tell that service provider this person's been referred, but they're number two in the processing order. Um, for subsidies where we have kind of like a pool of subsidies, so for example, right now we're matching to HACA subsidies, we have 80 subsidies. So if someone has a completed application at this point and they're um, referred, the biggest thing is being responsive when someone reaches out and completing any documents that are requested. When those two things happen, the very much the majority of the time a referral can, will lead to a housing opportunity being secured. Um, when it happens less often is when we're in a situation where there's one unit and multiple referrals for the one unit. 
Also, a lot of the time though, when that happens, that other person, because they're document ready and we're able to be referred to that unit, as soon as we know that number one is moving forward, a lot of times we'll reach out to the provider and talk about other housing options for that individual. So it's not like if they don't get that, 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 that it's over. Um, there's oftentimes other opportunities the individual can be matched to if they're on the target list. It's not across the board that that happens because sometimes there's really specific eligibility criteria which leads to someone being matched that may not qualify or be eligible for other opportunities based on their prioritization. But most of the time referral leads to uh, someone moving in as long as they kind of follow up throughout the process. And lastly, are there options for 290 registrants? Yes. Um, it's good for us to know that because we know that some things won't be an option. So there are some things that are automatically uh, people are not eligible for, but there are certainly opportunities that people are eligible for regardless of that. So yes, there are. The universe is slightly smaller, but there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunities that that that's not a prohibiting factor for. Now for some of the scattered site subsidies that it's not a prohibiting factor for, which is most of the scattered site subsidies, it can then potentially be harder to find an actual unit, um, but it doesn't prohibit access to most subsidies and there are also some site-based units that it won't impact their eligibility. That's it for now, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of gloss over this. Um, again, in the interest of time. So talking about documenting HUD chronic homelessness. So when we're talking about core documents and talking about having that documentation done, there's three types of verification that's recognized by HUD. One is HMIS records, and that has to be either program entries or exits, outreach contacts or living situation assessment. So someone being open to housing navigation, for example, does not verify their homelessness. Third party documentation, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about today, that's gonna to be the most often used form of verification of homelessness. And then self-certification, which only can be used if there's no ability to obtain the other forms of documentation. And there's um, documentation of the attempt to obtain the other forms of documentation because HUD only allows 25% of, of the self-certified. Um, so we're going to talk more about third-party documentation when we talk about chronic homelessness. I'm just checking the time. Okay, so HUD's definition of chronic, chronically homeless has three elements. So for an individual to be considered chronically homeless, and the reason we're going over this is because many subsidies in our community require that someone meets uh, the HUD definition of chronic homelessness and that there's documentation to support that. Also, if you know how to document chronic homelessness, you know how to document literal homelessness because it just, you know, you can document it in the same way that you document chronic homelessness, but you only need to show that the person is presently at this moment homeless in order for them to meet the literal, literal homeless guideline, unless they're in rapid rehousing in which you need to show they were homeless upon entry, but we would delve into that deeper in a full training. So HUD's definition of chronic homelessness has three elements. One is that the person must be literally homeless at the time of application. They need to have a long duration of homelessness, which means they've either been homeless for the entire 12 months leading up to present. So that means they've been homeless since September of 2019, if we were filling this out today, or they need to have four episodes of homelessness, totaling a minimum of 12 months each having at least a seven day break in between. We sent out the chronic homeless verification packet um, with the email documents for this training. And this, this uh, definition is listed there. So you'll always be able to find that. It's also on our website. And the person must also be disabled. So we're gonna talk a little bit about documenting chronic homelessness. Again, this can be used for literal homelessness. Yadiel, could you drop that link in the chat? So we sent out this, um, our chronic homeless verification packet with the training materials, but we're also gonna drop the link in the chat. This packet is really a helpful guide and uh, helps with the documentation of chronic homelessness in our community. It gives the definition of chronic homelessness. It provides some guidance on how to figure out if someone's chronically homeless. Um, and then there's also templates for all of the documents. So for the professional assessment of living situation and the witness statement, which we're gonna talk about more, there's also a template for documenting disability in there. Um, and there's page three of it, which I think is really um, helpful 
is a chart that has the different living situations and tells you what that living situation would mean toward documentation of chronic homelessness. Okay, so this form I just wanna go over because many of you, this form is gonna be something that hopefully you will use in order to help document chronic homelessness. I do wanna say that it's all about providing a picture. So someone may have a professional assessment of living situation showing three months, HMIS showing six months, a witness statement showing three months, but it all adds up to the last 12 months, that's great. It doesn't have to be one resource to, to provide evidence of chronic homelessness. So this form is used by service providers and think of service providers broadly. It can be used by people in the education system, the healthcare system, law enforcement, um, probation, parole, all types of different service providers. This is the template, it's in the packet. It has to be copy pasted on letterhead and everything has to be filled out completely. I'm gonna kind of let folks take a look at this later because again, we're a little short on time, but make sure that one of the key things is the second column where uh, there's details of the interaction. Unless the service provider physically observed the living situation, they need to be somewhat descriptive in their ex explanation of the interaction, explaining why they believe the person was experiencing homelessness at that time. I kind of hate this. I wish that it was just because they said so, um, but that's unfortunately not acceptable by HUD, so we have to be a little bit more detailed than that. This is a summary of a witness statement. So in order for a witness statement to work for verification of homelessness, the witness has to physically observe the individual's living situation. It can't be based on their report, but this form can absolutely, absolutely be used in those cases. Um, there's a blurb that says when to use it at the top of the temp, Certainly you want to use it, you know, with permission from the person, from the consumer, and really they should be driving it. So they should be saying, hey, this is someone that can verify my homelessness. And then documenting disability. There are certain ways that disability has to be documented in order for it to meet HUD standards. One is a social security administration proof of benefits, so an award letter. Um, and then we have a template in our packet that if you all are doing letters or asking other people to verify a disability, I really encourage you to use that template because as long as all the blanks are filled in, it will meet HUD standards. So um, sometimes that's an easier way of doing it than trying to write a letter that meets all of the different criteria. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick little quiz just to kind of get everyone engaged again. What document is not part of the core housing and eligibility documents? Verification of chronic homelessness, disability verification, photo ID, or verification of literal homelessness. And we're just gonna give 20 seconds. Okay, so most people got it right. So verification of chronic homelessness, although is often required, is not a core housing and eligibility document. The four core documents are disability verification, color copy of a government issued photo ID, verification of literal homelessness, and a social security card or social security number verification. And you can always refer back to the materials and there's also materials on our website so you don't have to memorize it. Okay, so we are going to do breakout groups for the next six minutes and that is going to sort of bring us to the end of the presentation. So there, there's gonna be a scenario, there's gonna be a Google Doc dropped in the chat so that when you go into your breakout rooms, you'll have access to it. And you wanna answer these questions. Is the person literally homeless? Are they chronically homeless? And are they eligible to be considered for permanent part of housing? So do they meet the basic eligibility requirements? We would like to give more time for this, so you may not get to all of it, but hopefully you can have some good discussion for the time that we have. So we're gonna break you out now.
Sorry about that hiccup. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, folks were able to see the scenario. I know there was some trouble in the group that I was in with it. So if you didn't, sorry about that. Um, again, we can send this out so people can sort of go over it on their own and look at it. But um, this is sort of talking about Amy's situation. And then I'm going to bring up the next slide, which is our housing history chart with her situation. So this a blank version of this chart is in the chronic homeless verification packet. So you can use this to help guide you when you're working with someone to figure out if they meet the definition of chronically homeless um, and if they meet literal homelessness. So Amy is literally homeless. So she's at lifelong medical respite, which is considered an emergency shelter. So she does meet the definition of literal homelessness. She also has a disability. And so she is eligible for permanent part of housing. She meets the basic eligibility criteria for that. However, she's not chronically homeless. So that, that's where this definition gets tough. This one was supposed to be a little hard. So even though she has been homeless for 12 months in the past three years, she's only had two breaks in homelessness. So she's only had three episodes of homelessness and her current episode is nine months long, not 12 months or longer. So because she hasn't been homeless for the entire previous 12 months, she would have to have four episodes and she only has three. So feel free later on to read through this scenario and look at this chart to better understand what constitutes the break in homelessness and what constitutes a continued episode of homelessness. All right, and I know some of that might have felt a little bit rushed. We were trying to dip our toes in a lot of different things. I really appreciate you all hanging in there and engaging with the material. Uh, does anyone have any final questions? Hi, I I'm wondering if we should, oh, sorry. Just maybe, I don't know if this makes sense, this question, maybe I missed this information, but when do we complete this form? For what purpose? Is it to apply for a Section 8 or um, what's, yeah, what's the purpose of this form? Yeah, so for a lot of permanent supportive housing opportunities in our community, chronic homeless verification is required. So this form actually does not verify chronic homelessness, but it just can be a helpful guide as you're working with someone to sort of go through their housing history. It's not required, it's just an option. Um, but there, the entire chronic homeless verification packet was sent out with the meeting materials. So if you're working with someone who is working to apply for a per permanent part of housing opportunity that requires chronic, that's when that um, packet and this chart would come into play. Great, thank you. Yeah. If we fill out this chart with a client, should we, is there a reason to upload it to HMIS along with the actual verification? Um, I will tell you that some subsidy administrators appreciate it because it, they kind of don't have to do it on their own because, you know, when you're trying to figure out if someone meets a definition, you're sort of like writing it out. Uh, it's definitely not required, but if you're already uploading the verifications and you have it with it in the packet, there's definitely no reason not to. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions about anything in the presentation? I know we're kind of out of time. Um, so thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you got something out of it. Thank you for helping me struggle through my first Zoom training. Um, but it was great to spend some time with you all this morning. And I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Good job and great training. Thank, thank you. you. And I like my group. Great day. Thank you. you. I'm so smart. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Yep. <laughs> You did great. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.